A girl is resurrected and becomes evil, gaining extraordinary powers and possessing very powerful dark magic. The anim begins with this girl saying that at one point her name was Alicia, but now she is a young girl with black hair and golden eyes, and the only daughter of the powerful noble family, William. She also says, there is no doubt that this is the other world. Just yesterday I was someone else, and without a doubt, I have been resurrected as a villain's. After that, she leaves her room and says to the maid, good morning, which surprises the maid. Then, Alicia says, indeed, I must be different because I never got out of bed early or greeted anyone before. But from now on, I will do my best to become the greatest villainess in history. Now, this is redundant. It's time to study. There is still much for me to learn if I want to be a villainess. I will also need a strong body. She then goes to her older brother, William Albert, and says to him, good morning, which surprises him. He says to her, it's unusual to see you up so early in the morning. She asks him to teach her swordsmanship so she can be Kachambi strong. Surprised by her request, he asks, what makes you say that? Her two brothers are also surprised and comment that this must be one of her whims. But her eldest brother responds, I don't mind, we can start today. He tells her, to learn swordsmanship, you first need to increase your physical strength. You must do 100 push-ups and 50 sit-ups every day. If you can do that for a whole week, I will start your training. They think to themselves that no one can do that, but she replies, I will go now and see you next week. Later, in the library, she says that she needs to learn magic first, since she still needs to build her physical strength to learn swordsmanship. She explains that the William family is one of the five noble families and excels in dark magic. Magic mainly consists of the elements of darkness, light, water, wind, and fire. She first needs to study how to use magic from books. We find her in the library, but she can't find any magic books in the massive library. She says, I'll look for a book on plants now, and I must also be knowledgeable about everything beyond magic, medicinal herbs to reduce fever, edible wild birds, glowing appearances, and flying trees. I want to know all of this too. She reflects on how there are many things in this world that didn't exist in her old world, but she fully absorbs everything she reads. She remarks that to be able to read such a large number of books in one day, one must focus intensely. After that, we see her training, managing to count up to 50. And she says, this is very difficult, but I will do it so I can receive sword fighting lessons and become the greatest villainess in history. Later, she goes to sleep. And in the morning, she says, I will head to training again today. Nothing is impossible. And I will work on strengthening my muscles early today. She starts doing push-ups. And as she begins, she is surprised at how naturally and easily she can do them. She says, it was so difficult yesterday. How has it become easier? This is strange. Is it because this world is different from mine? She shrugs it off and says, well, that's better. After breakfast, she says, I'll head straight to the library. Maybe today I'll even find a book on magic. She reflects on how she's grown remarkably and can now do backflips in the air. She begins counting and realizes she can now do 500 pull-ups and 300 push-ups. This is incredible, she says. She also mentions that she read 10 books in just one hour ads ads. The art of swordsmanship and magic is truly amazing. But then she pauses and wonders aloud. Even with all this, despite how fast I'm developing, why was Alicia unable to do anything in the game I used to play? The next day during breakfast, her family comments that she now arrives early every day and asks what she has been doing all day. She thinks to herself, my family thinks I'm behaving strangely and has become worried about me. She replies with a smile, it's a secret. Later, we find her in the training grounds, and she says, today is the day I can finally fight with the sword. As she walks, she sees a young man with fiery red hair that looks as if it's ablaze. His name is Lord Eric from the Hardson family, whose magic element is fire. She also notices another young man with golden hair named Lord Finn from the Smith family, who wields the light element. Then there's a young man with green hair from the Curtis family, whose magic is forest magic. After that, Lord Gale, a young man with grey hair, appears, and he uses wind magic. Finally, she sees the only son of the king, Prince Duke of the royal family, who uses water magic. He has a distinctly different aura from the others. She thinks, this is a great opportunity for me. I must seize the chance to leave them with the impression that I am truly a villainess. She walks up to them and greets her older brother. The others look surprised and ask, is this your little sister? They comment on how beautiful she is, even though she's only seven years old. Alicia notices that they all seem more impressive than ordinary people, but she tells herself, this is an important moment. As the greatest villainess, I can't let them think I'm just a poorly behaved child. 
She introduces herself confidently. I am Alicia. It's a pleasure to meet you. They are astonished by her demeanor and say, she's not like what we were told. She's so young but seems to have a good head on her shoulders. Her brother chimes in, no, she's just fickle. Last time she asked to learn sword fighting and today is the day I promised her training. Alicia says eagerly, let's start training now. But her brother replies, yes, but I only said that if you completed the exercises every day. She confidently tells him, I did it. I completed the exercises. He seems doubtful which angers Alicia. She grabs his sword, kicks a tree, causing an apple to fall, and slices it in half in an instant. She tells him, please don't let my effort go to waste. I'm sure I've told you that before. At this point, her brother agrees and says, all right, I'll train you. She tells him she'll return shortly after changing her clothes. Sassy holds the sliced apple. Her brother thinks to himself, this is incredible. What happened to my little sister who used to be selfish and moody? She's now honest and determined. A year later, Alicia is still training, only practicing sword swings. Her brother told her that there's no point in training unless she can wield the sword for hours. Alicia admits that if she weren't trying to become the greatest villainess in the world, she would have grown tired of the monotonous training. Throughout the year, Prince Duke has been visiting them frequently, and it seems he's taken a liking to her. After Alicia finishes her training, Lord Finn, the one with the light element, comes to her and asks, have you finished your training today? She tells him that she's just going to take a break and notes that this is the first time they've spoken to each other. He then asks her, why are you training so hard to learn swordsmanship? She replies that she wants to have a strong grip, but doesn't tell him that she wants to become the greatest villainess. He responds, I look forward to seeing that. Then her older brother arrives and hands him a book saying, why have you been visiting us so often these days? I thought the books were the reason, but could it be that my sister is the reason? The Duke replies, I wish I knew the reason myself and it seems he is fond of her. The scene shifts to all the noble families, including Alicia's. Her father mentions that the village of Luana has faced worsening living conditions year after year, making it uninhabitable. The Duke responds, but we've already sent aid quickly. It won't be well received by the people. However, someone else says, but it's a village of diggies or village of criminals after all. The Duke interjects, shouldn't the golden rose be our priority? Our kingdom and our people need hope. The noble families agree, saying, as one of the five great noble families, we feel it's time for a break. Mm. Later, while they're drinking tea, one of the lords mentions that his son Finn wishes for Lady Alicia to visit their home again. His father responds, I told her not to cause any trouble. They all comment on how Alicia has become very polite, considering she used to be selfish and paid no attention to anyone. Her father, Arnold, adds, about a year ago, she suddenly started spending most of her time in the library, and I have no idea why. At this moment, Finn arrives and thanks Alicia for attending his tea party. He mentions that they have other guests today, including King Albert, who will also be coming. Oh, he then opens the door and finds that all the children of the five noble families are gathered there. Alicia wonders, what are they all doing here? Finn asks, why hasn't he arrived yet? The others respond, he'll be here soon. Alicia then finds a map and says, in the game I used to play, Alicia was exiled to a foreign land at the end. Is this really the end? She reflects, this is happening so quickly. The story is progressing at a very fast pace. Soon after, the king arrives and Alicia wonders, what brought the king here? What is he doing? She greets him, saying, good day, your majesty. The king orders her to raise her head and says, I've heard a lot about you and have always wanted to speak with you. That's why I came today. He then asks her, what is your opinion on the state of our kingdom and its current condition? Alicia, feeling nervous, thinks to herself, I don't understand the point of the question. Is he really discussing politics with an eight-year-old? The king then told her that he would get straight to the point and asked her opinion about the state of their kingdom, Dorcas. Alicia was shocked by the question, unable to grasp its significance. It seemed impossible for him to be discussing politics with an eight-year-old. After thinking for a moment, she suspected that this was a test to determine whether she had the potential to become a great villainess. She replied that, if she may say so, despite Dorcas's immense power, it cannot truly be considered a great nation. She explained that while their economy may be strong, most of the wealth is concentrated in the hands of the nobles, widening the economic gap. In places like Luana, life is so difficult that many people don't know if they can afford bread for the next day, which increases resentment toward the nobles and could spark a revolution at any moment. The king responded that they needed to improve the economy, but he was unsure how to go about it. 
and asked her how she would fix the situation. Alicia suggested they could take advantage of the neighboring city of Calvera and its gold mines. The king replied that Calvera was ruled by Laval, and they couldn't simply take the mines. Alicia clarified that they wouldn't steal the mines but rather finance Calvera's independence. It would be better to avoid conflict with Laval and maintain a superficial relationship while trading with Calvera. By doing this, Dorcas would gain leverage, and after Calvera gained independence, Dorcas would have the upper hand in trade relations. The king understood her suggestion as exploiting others for profit and was impressed. Alicia, meanwhile, thought to herself that if she continued down this path, she would eventually sever her connection with the protagonist. She was now truly on her way to becoming the greatest villainess. The king expressed his delight in speaking with her that day, then left with his advisor, commenting on how pleased he was with what he had heard. His advisor then asked to discuss something important. The golden rose had been found. Later, we see Alicia enjoying a large array of sweets, overjoyed by the sight. Duke watches her from a distance. The scene shifts to Duke talking to Alicia, handing her a birthday gift and apologizing for the slight delay. Alicia opens the gift and is astonished to find a necklace with a small diamond. She thanks him and promises to take good care of it. Duke then leaves and Alicia muses to herself, diamonds are far more valuable in this world than in my previous one, but why did he give me one? The scene transitions to the king speaking with some men, showing them the golden rose. He explains that when a certain man's only daughter was born, a rare rose bloomed and he kept it. That man's daughter is the saintess. Another man interjects, she is the girl who will unite with the ruler of the kingdom to guide people to peace and save the world. When the person who will determine the kingdom's fate is born, a special rose blooms. We confirmed this when the blue rose bloomed for Duke. The golden color, they believe, is reserved for the saintess. The king confirms, saying, Yes, now we have two people connected to the roses, Duke, for whom the blue rose bloomed, and the girl, for whom the gong rose bloomed, with their leadership, the kingdom will flourish. The king's advisor then remarks that difficult times surely await them, and the king replies that the legend says the saintess must unite with a member of the royal family, and they must accept their fate. The scene shifts to Alicia in the palace, thinking to herself, if Duke ever falls in love with the protagonist and asks me to return her, I won't. I'll look him in the eye and refuse, like a true villainess. Soon, the villainess that history will remember will make her mark. And that's how today's episode ends. Stay tuned for the next episodes, and don't forget to subscribe and turn on the notification bell to stay updated with all the latest content. A regular guy gets summoned to another world and gains incredible powers after being bullied by his classmates. However, he decided to change and become a better and stronger person. Our story begins today with this protagonist named Haruka, who is fleeing from monsters, saying that his story started when he was in school. Despite being surrounded by many people, he was always alone. He mentions that he was lonely in the real world, choosing to distance himself from his classmates. Among them were the popular kids, the gaming nerds, the fashion obsessed, and the gym rats. He felt like he didn't belong to any of these groups. One day, a magical circle appeared, engulfing the entire room. For a moment, he was excited, thinking this was just like the book he was reading, but he quickly realized that getting involved in another world would be a big hassle. He was fine just reading light novels and didn't need to actually travel to another world. Haruka tried to leave by opening the door, hoping to avoid getting caught in the magic circle. He thought escaping through the windows wouldn't work, so he tried hiding in the room upstairs, but in the end, he found himself in a completely white room. He wonders aloud, wait, why isn't anyone here? Usually there'd be a fat king or a beautiful princess appearing, right? But instead, he's surprised to see an old man wandering around. What's this? Is this old guy lost and ended up in a different world by mistake? He must be senile Haruka mutters. The old man replies, I'm not Sinai and tells Haruka to choose a skill. He also mentions that Haruka's classmates have already prepared themselves and left for the new world, so he should get ready as well. The old man shows him a large screen full of skills to choose from. Haruka notices that, typically, everyone gets 50 points to allocate towards skills and magic, but 43 people had already gone ahead, leaving him with only scraps. There were no valuable skills left. Frustrated, Haruka scolds the old man, demanding a useful skill. The old man responds, you can take all the leftover skills if you want and then sends him to the new world. Haruka wakes up and exclaims, that old man actually threw me into another world without a second thought. What was he thinking? Nah. At the very least, Haruka wishes he'd been given some time to prepare or gather some gear. As he looks down, he notices a bag on the ground. What's this he says? Opening it to find a cloak. He puts it on, remarking, I look pretty legit now with all this gear. My title as the round hero doesn't seem so bad with this look. I guess my situation isn't that terrible then. 
the system tells him that he has to roll the dice. Haruka remembers that the old man had given him all the leftover skills, including the dice skill. He rolls the dice, and it lands on the letter M confused. He mutters, what does this mean? I hope it's something good a screen pops up, asking him where to allocate the points, and he chooses to put them into the luck category. Suddenly, his stats appear, and he is shocked to see that his luck has been maxed out. He realizes that the M stood for maximum, but then notices that all his other stats are in a terrible state. To his dismay, he finds another skill that states he will always be alone and unable to join any teams. Every time he tries to team up with someone, they will flee from him. However, he also gains an additional ability he can manipulate creatures and become friends with them. Haruka is stunned. What? Are you kidding me? I have to survive alone in this world too, he says in disbelief. But despite his frustration, he decides to face the challenge. Well, I wanted to go on this journey with companions, but it doesn't matter where I go if I'm going to be alone. Let's move forward, he declares. Thinking of his classmates, he notes, everyone from my class was transported to this world too, but I haven't seen any of them yet. Even if I do, I won't be able to form a team with them. For now, I need to find shelter. It would also be great if I found some food. Haruka begins walking through a dense forest, struggling to see through the thick trees. He worries if a monster attacks me from behind, I won't be able to react in time suddenly. He remembers that the old man had given him special contact lenses. He puts them on and is amazed to see everything clearly. The lenses start identifying the locations and functions of objects around him, providing detailed information on every item. Haruka remarks, I can even see in the dark with these lenses. My ability to understand things has become much stronger making searching for items much easier and more enjoyable. He begins filling his bag with edible food and mushrooms. I feel like I can find anything in the blink of an eye, he exclaims. After drinking from a nearby river, he spots a cave in the distance and heads toward it. Though frightened at first, he enters cautiously, only to find that the cave is empty. Relieved, he unpacks his bag, sets up his magical tent, and says, it seems I'll be able to live here comfortably for a while. Haruka then recalls the firewood he collected earlier. If I use this to raise the temperature he muses, the monsters will stay away when they see the fire. He lights the fire and says, A lot has happened today, and I'm exhausted. I should sleep, but before that I'll check my status opening his status window. He sees that his fire magic skill has improved. Satisfied, he falls asleep. The next morning, Haruka wakes up and reflects. Thanks to my monster repelling skills, nothing attacked me overnight. My home is safe, he prepares and cooks breakfast. And while eating, he remarks, I'm getting pretty good at surviving in this other world. Now, more than anything, I need to ensure a steady supply of food and safety. While gathering supplies, Haruka spots a medicinal herb, but at that moment he is confronted by small goblins. These goblins, he mutters, they're small, but they're stronger than me. Can I beat them? He hesitates, but then steals himself, thinking, even if I'm trapped here, I have to fight them eventually. So I'll strike with a fast surprise attack. Haruka attacks the small goblin using his magic staff, charging it with magical energy and shouting, let's go he leaps at the goblin, striking it hard and knocking it unconscious. Another goblin immediately tries to attack him, but Haruka dodges the blow and finishes it off with a powerful magic blast, defeating both small goblins. Later, we find Haruka by the river, washing his face. He sighs, I survived my first battle. It wasn't perfect, but it went well suddenly. He feels exhaustion creeping in and decides to head home to rest. Sitting by his campfire, he eats his meal. Examining the goblin's weapon beside him, he mutters, it's useless too heavy and too short for me to wield then. Checking his status, he's surprised to see that he's leveled up to level two. I've progressed more than I expected, he notes. The next morning, Haruka is eating but is already tired of eating the same food every day. I want some meat, he complains, but I'd probably get scolded by my class president for being wasteful still. He reflects, at least I've solved the problem of immediate hunger. Now I need to focus on getting stronger. I don't like the idea of growing just by getting attacked by stronger monsters. If I have time, I want to. He trails off, thinking about improving his home, and decides he wants to strengthen both his offensive and defensive capabilities. Let's go out and practice magic, he declares. He's excited because he has the blessing of the forest, and as he steps outside, he feels lighter. It's like I'm teleporting, he exclaims, thrilled with the sensation. Haruka then encounters a group of goblins and begins attacking them one by one. I can defeat them easily, he says, feeling confident. Compared to yesterday, he realizes he's growing stronger day by day. I can now take on three in a row after a long battle with the goblins. He decides to stop and concludes, I guess today's magic practice is over. 
He continues this routine for several days and by the fifth day, Haruka manages to defeat a goblin with a single strike. He also gathers enough wood to start building his house. Finally, he says things are falling into place in this other world, just as I had hoped, however. He's still craving some meat. While chasing a rabbit, he successfully catches it, but as he holds it in his hands, he suddenly receives it receives a notification that someone is nearby. Haruka spots his classmates approaching in the distance. Not wanting anything to do with them, he quickly covers the rabbit's mouth to silence it. Glancing around, he sees the class vice president, followed by the rest of the class. In his mind, he reflects, this world is so big. I've known the vice president since our first day of school, and it seems I've fallen in love with her despite his feelings. He tells himself, no one can tell me what to do here, and nothing can defeat me in this world. I am the only monster slayer. And with that, the first episode of this new anime comes to an end. But before you go, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell to stay updated on all the latest episodes. Our first episode of Season 2 begins with the news that the Smurfoth Empire is dwindling, leading to rebellions across the kingdom while noble rulers in various regions strengthen their autonomy. The ruler of the Mizean region, Amador Salamakia, has passed away, causing a division in Mizean between two factions led by the late ruler's eldest son, Koran Salamakia, and his youngest son, Fasmerk Salamakia. Wah! Fasmerk occupies the capital, Arkanthis, declaring himself its heir, while Koran is rallying troops to overthrow him. Our hero, Aris, hails from a small province called Lamberg, and he sets off in a carriage to contribute to the war. We see our hero in the carriage enjoying some food, with Miri and Charlotte sitting atop the carriage. Aris asks them to come inside to discuss some matters before the meeting, but they refuse which angers Aris he asks them. Have you forgotten why we're going there? Miri replies that they haven't forgotten, but the weather is beautiful and they want to enjoy it a bit. Aris enters the carriage and is told by Ritz that Miri is right, he should take things more calmly and they will reach Simbla soon where they can see the sea. When everyone sees the sea, they are awestruck and decide to take a break. When Charlotte tries to drink water from the sea, she finds it very salty and unsuitable for drinking. She then asks Miri, have you visited places like this before? Miri tells her that she has traveled a lot and seen many oceans and volcanic islands while searching for precious magical stones. And she has visited many snowy mountains. Aris then tells them that once the war is over and they are at peace, they will travel together to visit many places. Charlotte then spots her friend Roussel playing with some fish, so she goes over to join him. We then see Miri telling Aris that he is great at winning the affection of those around him, which is very good. Then the scene shifts to Simbla Castle where Aris and his friends enter the castle and head to the military meeting room. Everyone looks at Aris, wondering why a ruler of such a small province is among them, as they are nobles. Aris approaches Lord Lemire and informs him that he received an invitation from Lord Koran just then. Lord Koran appears and welcomes Aris when he sees Miri beside him. He greets her and asks what she is doing with Aris. Miri tells him that she decided there's no harm in trying political matters with the young Aris, as he is a more suitable lord than most. Everyone is surprised by Miri's boldness and her manner of speaking to Lord Koran, prompting Lord Koran to laugh and comment that she is as bold and straightforward as ever. And one of the lords then mentions that Miri is related to Thomas Grangan, who is Fasmerk's right-hand man suggesting that she could be a spy. Lord Koran responds that he doesn't care about that. Miri is now Lord Aris's aide, and it was he who invited her. This could be an excellent opportunity to gather more information about the enemy's forces. He trusts Aris's abilities and will not tolerate any disrespect towards his aides. He adds that Miri served the previous ruler with great skill and that they need her talents to win the battle. He then calls everyone to start the council. Next, we see Lord Karan's aide presenting a report on the current war situation, stating that their forces number 110,000, while the enemy outnumbers them by about 20,000. However, controlling the trading city of Simbla gives them a financial advantage, allowing them to fund war efforts for years to come. They also have an edge regarding the efficiency of their troops, but the enemy possesses more skilled forces, and there's no guarantee of victory in this battle. Defeating Fasmerk is the first step toward establishing an independent state. One of the lords suggests that they should seize the eastern city of Bertudo, as it is one of the largest cities alongside Simbla and Arkanthis. Aye, however, its defenses are not as strong as those of Arkanthis. By demonstrating their power, they can weaken Bertudo's strength. To ensure victory, they must capture Bertudo first. Arth thought to himself. I guess it wasn't such a good idea, then he looked behind him and asked if he could share their thoughts with everyone. Ritz was the first to speak, as Arth wanted to hear everyone's opinions about the situation. However, she needed to be cautious with her tone, because everyone's fate hinged on this meeting. 
Merle then spoke up, saying, Listen, gentlemen, is this the best you can come up with by gathering everyone here? What a bunch of fools! One of the men became angry with her, but another, a high-ranking official, told her, Go on, speak your mind, she spoke fluently and said bluntly. At this rate, you will certainly lose everyone was shocked by her words, wondering how she could say such a thing. She explained that no matter how strong the soldiers were, or how vast the wealth, it would make no difference without competent leaders to exploit these resources. Trying to win with your current state is impossible, she added. One of the officials, angered, asked her, how dare you say such a thing? You'll pay for these words, but she interrupted him, saying, let me tell you about Vasmarch. He's a coward hiding behind the curtain, but if a full-scale war breaks out now, they will win seven times out of ten. You will need a vast number of forces to seize Berto, and after that, you'll have to return to Simbla to defend it. Meanwhile, if the enemy launches a clever attack during your absence, it will be a huge problem, and more nobles will likely join their side. Everyone was stunned, but she continued. Your downfall will be your inability to properly assess your enemy, the commander agreed with her, but added, I still want to win this war. No matter the cost, he then asked her if she had any other ideas. At that moment, Russell spoke up, and everyone was surprised, exclaiming, a child. What is a child doing here? Arth explained that Russell was the strategic expert in his region, but they scoffed, saying, what expert? How could a child come up with a respectable plan? The Lord then said, let's hear him. Russell stood and addressed them, saying, I was thinking before we got here, taking down Doe is a good plan, but there's a possibility they could attack Simbler while we're doing that. So, if we're concerned about defense, we need a way to keep the enemy trapped by making them think they'll be attacked from both sides if they leave Archontis. Could we draw the northern region of Baradil into the battle? He then showed them on the map how they could make their enemies believe Baradil would attack Archontis from the north. Everyone was in disbelief, saying, impossible. That's absurd. Baradil swore allegiance to the imperial family. Surely they've heard about Mazin's desire for independence, so they would never help us. Russell responded, that's why we'll need a mediator between us and Baradil. That mediator will be the Emperor of Smurforth. Everyone was astonished by Russell's words, so he explained that they would bribe the Emperor. One of the leaders opposed this idea, arguing, I doubt the Imperial family will be swayed by money, even considering their weakening power. Ritz interrupted him, explaining that the current Emperor is just a 17-year-old boy and that the real power lies with the servants around him, who are the source of the corruption. He believed that the possibility of destabilizing them with money was very high and that they could use their true strength to minimize bloodshed. It's a brilliant plan, he added. Lord Koran then decided that they would seek imperial intervention to gain the cooperation of the Baradil region. He informed Arth that he would leave the execution of the plan to him, along with selecting the individuals for the mission, as it was his idea. He also promised to prepare the funds needed for the task, instructing Lumir to assist Arth with the plan. Arth thanked him for the support. Later, we see Arthur and his companions sitting down to eat, feeling very pleased with their new mission. They were confident that if the plan succeeded, they would outshine the other followers. However, Arthur was deeply worried about what would happen to them if they failed. Merely reassured him, and then Charlotte expressed concern about how they could ask something so significant from the Emperor. Arthur replied that he was sure Ritz would handle the negotiations. Ritz then pointed out that racism was deeply entrenched in the Imperial capital, so it was better not to send him. Merle agreed with Ritz, saying that she, too, was not suited for such matters. Arth found himself uncertain of what to do, but then Lysha came to mind, and he decided to go to her. Indeed, Arth went to see Lysha, and when she saw him, she was overjoyed and welcomed him warmly, as did her father, Lord Hammond. Lord Hammond mentioned that he had heard about the military conference Lord Koran had recently held. Arth replied that he was here concerning that, wanting to discuss something with them briefly. As he had written in his letter, he had come today to consult with Lysha about the war. However, Lysha asked him not to talk about the war just yet, urging him to eat and rest first. Later, we see Ritz sitting with Hammond, thanking him for the delicious food. Hammond told him that there was no need for such thanks, especially considering his birth circumstances, adding, at least in my region, Lamberg and Blyde. Those things don't matter, Ritz then mentioned that Arth had come to discuss something important, but Lysha dragged him away again after dinner. The scene shifts to Arth and Leisha, where Arth is captivated by the beauty of the city. Leisha spoke to him, saying, I've wanted to bring you here when you visit us. I used to spend all my time at home until recently, but I've started interacting with the townspeople little by little, and I've made many friends. I've come to appreciate our region much more than before, and that's made me appreciate you 
and your brave approach to protecting your city even more. My father is always telling me about the amazing things you've done. I fear he may be a little jealous, Arth responded. It's mostly my friends who do the real work. Lysha then told him there was something she wanted him to see. They entered a place, and Arth was surprised by the sheer number of flowers there. She explained that they were grown from the flowers he had given her before, saying they were so beautiful that she couldn't help but plant more. She then asked him what it was that he wanted to discuss with her. Arth told her that it was a serious matter, and that he would need Lord Hammond's approval. She replied, No, I decide what I do on my own. That's why we're walking around without anyone interrupting us. My father worries a lot. Lysha was astonished and asked, Do you want me to take on a mission this important Arth responded? Yes, it's a negotiation, but it will take place outside our lands. So I can't fully guarantee your safety, Lysha smiled and said, I'm happy you asked me for this. I accept everything you say. I've decided to do whatever you ask of me. But there's something I want from you. I want you to marry me when the war is over. Arth was taken aback by her bold declaration. Lysha continued, I made up my mind on this the first day we met. I still remember our trip in Lamberg. I want to witness up close the kind and beautiful world you will create. Arth realized that Leisha truly loved him. Thinking back, she had done so much for him, and he had resolved to confess his feelings the next time they met. At that moment, Arth knelt before her and said, I am a humble man, and it's only because of you that we've reached this point. So please, let me say this instead, marry me now, my beloved Leisha. I've loved you since the day we first met and you've been a great support to me ever since. There's no doubt that hosting a wedding after the war would be easier, but we don't know when that will happen or what other dangers we might face in the meantime. I don't have much to offer, though I'm surrounded by amazing companions. But even in the midst of war, I want you by my side to protect you. So let's get married now. Leisha blushed deeply, covering her face with her hands and began to cry. Through her tears, she said, I have no intention of letting you protect me. I am the one who plans to protect you. Please continue walking the path you've chosen, just as you always have. You have so many incredible and trustworthy people around you. And as one of them, as your wife, I vow to dedicate my entire life to seeing your dreams come true. Arth, deeply moved, began to cry as well. He shouted, No, I will protect you, Lysha. They moved closer to one another, holding each other's hands tightly. Word soon reached her father, Lord Hammond, and he was shocked by the sudden news of their marriage. Arth approached him and said, I ask for your permission to marry your daughter, Lord Hammond. Still taken aback, responded. It's far too early for marriage, but his daughter firmly replied. I've made my decision, father. I won't change my mind about the wedding, no matter what anyone says, not even you. Lord Hammond was stunned. He thought to himself, you've always been my obedient daughter, never going against my wishes. You've always acted according to what others wanted. Finally, he sighed and said, I understand. Do as you wish, my daughter and make sure to support Arth until the very end his daughter was overjoyed and promised to do so. Lord Hammond embraced them both and instructed the servants to prepare a feast immediately. Everyone was filled with happiness as they enjoyed the food, desserts and drinks, celebrating the couple's union. The scene then shifts to Van, who says to Arth and his companions, I have completed the investigation into the Imperial family as you requested. The person who currently holds the Emperor's power is the Minister Shakma. His youthful energy contradicts his ambitions, and he shamelessly promotes any policies that benefit him personally. He will be a formidable opponent, and I urge you to be cautious of him, Arth. And with that, today's episode comes to an end. Stay tuned for more exciting events in the next episode, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you don't miss anything new. Our episode today begins with that dragon talking to himself. He says, as far as he remembers, he has never done anything that would make humans want to kill him. In fact, he would occasionally even speak to them, but why did they bind him in that way? As he starts to break free from the chains, it becomes clear that he is incredibly strong. Oh God, I hope this isn't an unworthy end for the ancient sacred dragon who has survived since the dawn of time, but maybe it's okay for there to be one who meets his end like this in the world. Then, the dragon runs and immediately dies. However, he is reborn as a small child. His parents name him Dolan, and they were very happy with his birth, unaware of his past life. After about 17 years, we see that Dolan has grown up significantly. At that moment, a girl named Airy comes to him and finds him deeply lost in thought. But he assures her that everything is fine and there's nothing to worry about. Then he grabs his bag and leaves. The scene shifts to a village called Veron, a small village on the northern border of the Kingdom of Arcrest. Dolan speaks to us 
saying that after his death as a dragon, he was born here as a human. He wakes up, washes his face, and mentions that farming is the only trade in this land. Every day, he goes out to the fields and works hard to earn his daily bread. He then eats breakfast and leaves. In this village, you're considered an adult when you turn 15, and it's expected that you live on your own. Now I'm 16 years old, so I left my house last year and live by myself now. So we then see him fishing, and he talks to his friend, saying that tomorrow he's going to investigate a large swamp where lizards have completely disappeared for over a month, so they need to do something about it. His friend suggests that this task should be left to the authorities responsible for protecting the swamp. There's no reason for you to go. Don't risk your life, his friend says. Dolan responds, brother, the leader and the others are busy guarding the village, but don't worry about me. I'll be fine on my own. I'm just going to check things out. Then he catches a large fish and returns midday with a basket full of fish. Afterward, he meets a girl named Marida, who congratulates him on his big catch, but insists that he should rest and prepare for tomorrow. Dolan tells her that he has rested plenty in the past few days and thanks her for helping convince the village leader and others to allow him to take on the task of investigating the swamp. She responds, it's our duty. You've helped us a lot in training. Dolan tells them he is very worried about them, but Albert speaks up and tells him not to worry and to prioritize the investigation tomorrow. Then, Dolan leaves and heads to his home. While preparing the fish for lunch, he talks to himself and us, saying that there are many monsters near the village of Varen, in addition to bandits, and there aren't enough soldiers to provide the same protection found in the city. So, it's expected for the villagers to help protect themselves. But after that, Eri comes to him, speaking to him through the window, reminding him that today is their magic training day. Dolan steps outside to join her and begins training, using his energy arrow spell to hit the target with precision. His magic was extremely accurate, causing Eri and the old witch to rejoice. The old witch tells him that he has improved significantly, and all the credit goes to her, because she was the one who pushed him in this direction. Dolan thanks her for the training, admitting that without her, he wouldn't have been able to do anything. The scene shifts to near sunset, where Dolan spots a beautiful girl and seems attracted to her. The old man introduces her as Christina and tells him that she will be staying in their village for a while. Then he whispers to Dolan, saying, listen Dolan, she's a young noble well, so behave well and be polite with her. Christina introduces herself, and they shake hands. Afterward, Christina and the old village leader leave the scene, but it seems that Christina is very skilled. Dolan also leaves and speaks to himself about the village's weather, how it's extremely cold in winter but very hot in summer. Finally, Dolan returns to his family home, where his brother Marco welcomes him. They sit together and have dinner, with Dolan expressing great joy over his mother's cooking, which he believes is unmatched. His father then brings up the idea of marriage, suggesting that a wife could help him with cooking, laundry, and the responsibilities of married life. Dolan responds by saying that his brother tells him the same thing, but he wants to enjoy bachelorhood a little longer. Marco asks if they'll be going to the swamp tomorrow, and Dolan confirms that they will indeed be heading to the swamp, where the lizards used to live. Their mother overhears this and becomes frightened because the swamp is far away, and the path there is very dangerous. Dolan reassures her, saying he won't take any risks, He'll just get close enough to take a quick look. His father tells him that he's an adult now, so the decision is his. But the most important thing is that he returns safely so they won't worry about him. Dolan thanks them and asks them not to worry, promising that he'll come back with a great story to tell them. The next day, Dolan is accompanied by the soldiers, who insist on going with him to ensure his safety, as it could be dangerous for him to go alone. Letitia cast a protective spell on Dolan, but the old witch stops telling Dolan that although she didn't want to worry him, she suspects something bad might be lurking there, so he should be cautious. Eri hands him his lunch to take with him. Dolan sets out for the swamp, which used to be home to lizards that occasionally interacted with the village of Veron, so one day they suddenly disappeared. Since no one else could investigate, Dolan volunteered to find out what happened. So when he arrives at the swamp, he touches the water and realizes why the lizards can no longer live there. The earth element is extremely strong here, while the water element has weakened significantly. Suddenly, Dolan senses the presence of something in the area. He prepares himself, knowing that only a powerful monster could survive in this swamp now. Out of nowhere, a girl named Celine appears half-human, half-serpent. She calls Dolan a fool for coming here alone, 
Dolan quickly understands that this is the girl everyone has been talking about. Celine ponders what to do with him and begins making strange gestures to scare him, but Dolan remains unmoved. She then tells him she didn't come here to fight. Suddenly, a massive monster appears and Celine becomes terrified. Dolan saves her and they flee, hiding behind a large stone. Celine, trembling, asks him what that huge creature is. Dolan tells her to stay quiet for now. As the monster moves away, Dolan explains that it is a crazed earth element creature. The lizards used to live here, but they all vanished one day. He recalls hearing about a major earthquake recently, which might have affected elemental creatures. Um, this monster will never return to its normal state. Dolan then introduces himself and asks Celine if she can use magic. As he heard that all Lamia creatures can, Celine admits she can indeed use magic, and Dolan suggests they fight the creature together. Celine is initially hesitant, fearing that, since it's an earth monster, her magic might not work. Dolan pleads with her to try, and Celine agrees. She begins casting the unique Lamia spell, believing it could affect the monster. Dolan tells her he'll advance while she supports him from behind, and she agrees. They prepare to fight together. Despite having just met, Dolan signals for her to use her magic. Celine then chants her spell, invoking her Lamia curse. Serpent within me, arise and curse my enemy. A snake emerges from the ground and attacks the monster, but it struggles to hold on. The monster strikes it, and Dolan leaps into action, dodging the creature's attacks. So I've infused my sword with dragon magic. He shouts as he slashes the monster, cutting it in half and killing it. Celine cheers, overjoyed that Dolan succeeded. She then says, I'm covered in mud. Dolan rushes to her side, thanking her for her help. They finally introduce themselves properly, with Celine saying, I'm a Lamia, as you can see. Dolan suggests she clean herself up, and then they can dry her clothes. You must be feeling cold, he adds, offering his assistance. The scene shifts to a cave, where we see Dolan cooking. Celine asks him, aren't you afraid of me at all? Dolan replies, no, you seem different from the Lamia creatures I know. They are usually more cautious around humans and far more aggressive. I don't think there are any Lamia villages around here. What are you doing here? Celine responds, when a Lamia turns 17, there's a rule that says we have to leave to find a husband. According to that rule, I'm on a journey to find a mate. Lamias are a race made up of only females, so we only give birth to girls. It's rare for us to bear boys, and if it happens, they're always from our husband's race. So Lamias were created when a human woman was cursed, and that curse has been passed down through generations. We are part snake, and our body fluids contain venom, so we need a partner with a strong body that can resist toxins. Dolan replies, I see. It must be more difficult for your kind to find a partner compared to other races. Selim continues, my mother met my father on a journey like mine. He was human, like you. They get along wonderfully. Then she asks Dolan, are you treating me like a child? He responds, no, I was just thinking you're a very cute Lamia, but don't worry about it, and hands her some food. So I'm not as good a cook as my mother, but I think it's tasty. Celine takes a bite and is astonished, saying, it's delicious. It smells so rich and flavorful. Dolan, pleased, says, I'm glad you like it. My mother taught me how to make it. On cold winter nights, we'd all gather around the pot to eat together. Celine smiles warmly and says, you smile so gently when you talk about your family. You must love them a lot. Dolan, surprised, thinks to himself, yes, because the lonely dragon is gone now. Out loud, he adds, I do love my family very much. Afterward, Dolan bids farewell to Celine, saying, I'm sure you'll find a wonderful partner. I've heard Lamias are drawn to life energy. At that moment, an electric charge sparks from Dolan towards Celine, causing her to fall to the ground. Dolan quickly apologizes, saying, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. I'll be heading back to my village now. When your journey is over, visit us with your husband. I'll introduce you to my family. Celine responds, I'll be heading south to continue my search for a mate. Dolan smiles and says, may the path you walk be blessed. And so, today's episode of this anime comes to an end. Stay tuned for future episodes. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell to stay updated with all the latest content. A simple young man named Noel witnesses his grandfather die in front of him while fighting monsters. There's no hours to become the best explorer in the world, a world full of monsters and countless adventures. Despite his modest abilities, he has ambition, determination and perseverance. Can Noel truly become the best explorer in the world? Follow along to find out.
Our first episode begins with Noel telling us about the appearance of a deep, dark abyss when mana in the air reaches a critical mass. This abyss opens a gateway to the demonic void, and the deeper it gets, the stronger the monsters that emerge from it. On a fateful night, an abyss with a depth rating of 12 appeared, a rating dangerous enough to bring forth the lords of the monsters. We then see Noel standing with his grandfather, who tells him that they need to leave the house immediately because monsters are attacking the city. Noel's grandfather takes him to the shelter to ensure his safety and tells him that he will go fight the monsters until reinforcements also steal away his wife. Noel, angry, tells his grandfather that no support is coming from the capital, and if he fights the monsters alone, he will die. His grandfather reassures him, telling him not to underestimate his strength, that he is unbeatable, and that he will keep Noel safe, even if it's the last thing he does. He leaves to fight. To fight. The grandfather goes out into the city and battles the enemies. Meanwhile, Noel worries for him. After the battle ends, Noel goes out into the city and sees the monsters slain on the ground alongside his wounded grandfather. His grandfather tells Noel that his end has come and he is going to die. He asks Noel, do you want to become an explorer, Noel? Will you follow my path? Noel cries and tells his grandfather that he will become an explorer like him and never accept defeat. Noel vows this to his grandfather, who then tells Noel that he loves him before passing away. Noel weeps deeply for his grandfather. Noel then tells us that his grandfather's name was Brandon Stalnan, who had defeated the Silver Cossitis, a monster from the depth of Abyss 13 Amidera Arash were in depth to basis 13. He became known as Overdeath, meaning the invincible demon, and the greatest explorer of all time, Eeyore. Two years later, we see Noel with his friends, having become an explorer like his grandfather. They attack and slay a monster, but soon encounter vampires of a lower bloodline, unable to use magic skills. However, their queen can reproduce on her own and birth as many offspring as she wishes. Noel and his friend, Walter, manage to kill them, and Noel warns Walter not to underestimate these creatures. Though small, they are strong enough to tear apart a bull with their hands. As Noel attacks another monster, Tanya steps in and kills it, explaining that if they don't cut off the heads of these monsters, they will regenerate. She says they must always decapitate them. Walter asks why they don't just go and kill the queen of these monsters, as doing so would prevent her from spawning more offspring. Noel responds that it's a bad idea because such a mission is extremely difficult for explorers of their rank, which is C. He advises that they should eliminate all her offspring first before confronting the queen, as this will greatly increase their chances of success. She tells Walter to stop obsessing over speed and efficiency, or he will get himself killed with no one to save him. Beyond the odd, Walter feels intimidated by Noel's words, as Noel is the leader and has the final say in all battle strategies, so he is their frontline defense. The only reason they are even attempting a mission of rank B while they are rank C is because of Noel's skill, Silver Tongue, for which they owe him a great deal. As they were talking, suddenly, a monster appeared from behind and released a foul-smelling stench of poisonous gas. Zaguar, he missed gas. They were now in big trouble. When Tanya tried to attack, the monster struck her, knocking her to the ground. Dodo turned to Vind and attacked, but they were powerless without Noel, who had been hit by the gas and started coughing, unable to breathe. Noel suddenly snapped back to his senses after remembering the promise he made to his grandfather. Set he quickly grabbed his weapon, stood before the enemy, and used his special power. Wah! He could enhance everyone's abilities by 25%. Then, he used a wide area attack by boosting morale through the sound of the great battle cry, which significantly increased his team members' endurance and mana. Noel ordered Tanya to deploy shields on the monsters, while Lloyd and Walter were to resume their attacks. Their strikes were successful, but when Noel looked up, he saw more monsters hidden above. Instead of discouraging him, the sight only fueled Noel's excitement. He declared, in just 74 seconds, we will defeat our enemies. I will take care of the weaker ones, while the three of you focus on the queen, Tanya, keep deploying their shields. Noel then unleashed his Thunder Howl ability, which had the power to stun all the monsters. He followed this by using his deadly weapon, the Ice Bullet, which killed all the enemies except one that managed to escape. Unfortunately, Noel had only one combat ability left. So far, 31 seconds had passed out of the 74 they had set. They had 43 seconds remaining. What would Noel and his friends do next against these mighty monsters? Noel instructed Lloyd and Walter to activate their offensive skills on the Queen. They did so using the Ara Blade and Deadly Rush, successfully killing the monster and confirming the death of the enemy leader. After the battle was over, 
Blue Horizon had completed their mission. Everyone knew that the offspring would stop moving once the queen was dead. By however, the battle had been incredibly reckless. At that moment, Noel recalled a memory from his childhood with his grandfather. Noel was crying because his friends told him he was too weak and he wanted to become a strong warrior like his grandfather. His grandfather told him to stop crying and reassured him that he resembled his mother greatly. But unlike her, his grandfather saw a natural talent in Noel for becoming an explorer, so he promised to train him to become the greatest explorer of all time. Returning to the present, Noel spoke to himself, vowing to be just like his grandfather No, even greater. He would surpass the infamous over death, even if he was the weakest among them. The group then headed to Atrey, the imperial capital of the Stelafdelnd Empire. This empire thrived on prosperity, thanks to magical engineering. The lands of Felnant were more prone to the appearance of the Abyss than others, leading the empire to pioneer mere magical engineering, the study and use of materials extracted from monsters. This had now become the largest industry in the empire, and explorers who hunted monsters and purified the lands tainted by the Abyss naturally became the heroes of the people. E. We then see Noel and his group having a meal at a restaurant, Noel mentions that as soon as he turned 15 and earned his explorer's certification, he decided to move to Etre and start looking for allies. As a strategist, he knew he couldn't fight without a team. Walter, clearly in high spirits, says they did great today. Considering how well they've performed in just their first year, they can aspire to much greater things. Noel decides to focus on gaining more experience with this team seeing it as the first step toward achieving his ambitions. Walter notices Noel doesn't seem happy and suspects it might be about the profits. He reminds Noel that they came here to celebrate and that worrying about money isn't worth it. He guesses Noel's grandfather would have told him the same. Bajan, Tionelfo. Noel recalls his grandfather's advice, explorers must be meticulous about money. Always go to the field with the best equipment and tools you can buy. Without money, you're powerless, and then you can kiss your dreams goodbye. A bad reputation is just a badge of honor for us explorers. They may call you a demon, but never let anyone look down on you. Back in the present, Noel says, I'm not mad. It's over. Tanya interjects. You're the one who keeps bringing it up. It's pathetic. Walter getting upset, says, the only one being pathetic here is him. His greed is going to tarnish Blue Horizon's reputation. Um, you should apologize. Noel responds, fine, I'm sorry for being wrong all the time, and for you always being right such a shining example for us all. Walter, now angry, says, all you do is hide behind us and give orders. You stay safe while we risk our lives out there. Noel replies, so those are your true feelings. You think you're useful, while I'm just dead weight. Lloyd steps in to defuse the situation, saying, we're in a public place, and you two are making us look like fools. Let's wrap this up and split the reward. Lloyd speaks privately with Tanya about the party's finances. After covering party expenses, equipment repairs, and the subcontractors we were left with 250,000 vils each. So but our party's assets are steadily growing. If we land another big job, we could make a huge profit. Noel joins the conversation and says to Lloyd, high paying jobs like this are rare. They unlike the major clans that get direct government contracts. We're just subcontractors. The big clans keep the high risk abyss clearing missions for themselves. And if they subcontract, they charge a massive fee. But we have 12.8 million vils right now. We're going to use that money to start our own clan. Lloyd responds, but the government requires 20 million to establish a clan. Noel confidently says, I know. I'll cover the remaining 7.2 million myself. We'll make more profit with our own clan instead of living off the scraps from others. Lloyd, still cautious, adds, we'll also need a base of operations in Etre and we should consider the cost of rent. Noel reassures him, I know a place we can rent for cheap. We need to move quickly. I've studied clan structures for a long time as an explorer and I have all the knowledge we need. All that's left is the experience and the only way to gain that is by doing it. We'll never get there if we don't take risks. Lloyd agrees but expresses concern. We're still young and inexperienced. If we can't earn the government's trust, the big jobs will keep going to the established teams. Noel, in response to Lloyd's previous concerns, jokingly corrects him, saying, we may be young, but we're also handsome that works in our favor. The Empire tells explorers it wants the citizens to aspire to be like us. 
famous explorers become public heroes and celebrities. Youth, good looks, and charisma most successful clans have members with these traits. If we sign promotional deals with companies, we'll also get sponsorship money. Walter, bewildered by this, asks, are you saying Noel? That's the higher ups will give us jobs because we're young and good looking. Tadasaru to Noel reply nilipli. Yes, and dull yourself short. Walter, you've got your own charm. Even if it's not for everyone, Tonya, visibly uncomfortable with the idea of selling herself this way, expresses her displeasure. Walter, however, sees no point in waste him and exclaims, let's just form the clan quickly, friends. Tanya grows more irritated and Noel reassures her, there's nothing wrong with wanting fame, power and money. When I achieve that, I'll have everything I desire. Noel's eyes grow determined as he firmly declares, starting a clan is something I won't back down from. Hey, even if all of you refuse, I'll find new members for this clan. I've told you this from the beginning. My dream is to become a greater explorer than the legendary Overdeath. Noel's intense conviction and the fire in his eyes inspire the group. Lloyd speaks up, saying, I'm in. Since I'm the leader, I support this decision. The group agrees to discuss the details further the next day and then smays, each heading home. The following day, Walter rushes to Noel, frantic and breathless telling him, Lloyd and Tanya have betrayed us. They left on their own. Noel is shocked by this revelation, stunned by the sudden turn of events. So what could Lloyd and Tanya be planning? Will the group meet again? This will all be revealed in the next episode. Stay tuned and don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell to stay updated with all the latest content. The episode of this anime begins with the protagonist, Hikaru, who is wandering the streets at night. Suddenly, from a distance, he sees a strong beam of light reaching up to the sky. He is amazed when he sees it, as he has no idea what could be causing it. After this, we see a strong girl named Aki, who is trying to enter an industrial area the Kagami building. However, the security guards stop her. Aki doesn't respond to them, and they notice that she has a mechanical arm. They decide to call for backup. In response, Aki uses her strength and tries to take them all down. The guards counter by using weapons designed to neutralize mechanical arms, successfully restraining her. At this point, a man appears and tells the guards to stop fighting. He says he will retrieve the cube from her, as mechanical arms are merely tools for humans like them. He then tells Eki that he will teach her how to properly use a tool, as despite her having two arms, they are nothing but scrap metal if not used correctly. Aki becomes furious with him and uses her mechanical arms to try to kill him. A huge battle ensues between the two, with Aki attempting to strike him from all directions, but she is unable to land a hit. The leader then orders the guards to capture her, but they fail, as Aki manages to free herself and kills many of the guards. She then moves toward the leader to strike him, but he hits her instead, causing the cube to fall from Aki's hand. At that moment, we see Hikaru watching from a distance, witnessing the entire event. Suddenly, he hears a voice asking him for help. The next morning, we see Hikaru in his bed, waking up to go to school. He gets ready and boards the train to head to class. While on the train, he looks up information on his phone about what happened the previous night. Meanwhile, his classmates greet him and talk about Yakumo Kagomi, the most famous man in Kitagami. However, Hikaru is too engrossed in his phone to listen to them. His friends ask him what he is looking at, and Hikaru starts talking to them. At this point, the scene shifts to Aki, who is standing near the place where she fought last night. She is talking to Sense and Dax, her mechanical arms, who ask her to retrieve the cube and not fail like she did the day before. Then we see Hikaru in his classroom, looking out the window. He tells his friends that he heard a voice coming from far away, which made him look outside. He then shows them a video, explaining that he saw the area around the Kagami building light up in a very strange way. When he climbed up the hill to get a better look, the building exploded, and he saw something glowing fall to the ground near him. However, the glowing object doesn't appear in the video. At this point, their friend Shireyama joins them and asks what they're doing. So one of Haikaru's friends tells her that Haikaru claims to have seen some strange light and also heard a weird voice. They ask him what the voice sounded like, and Hikaru tells them that it said, Will someone help me? All of his friends start making fun of him, which annoys Hikaru. Just then, he hears the voice again and is shocked. Without saying a word, he rushes toward the source of the voice. When Hikaru reaches the location, a security guard sees him and warns him not to go beyond that area because it is extremely dangerous. He advises Hikaru to go home immediately. Hikaru feels uneasy but then hears the voice again and runs quickly toward it. As he runs, he finds the cube lying on the ground. 
Hikaru is scared because the voice is coming from the cube. He hesitantly reaches out to touch it, and suddenly the cube glows brightly. A powerful beam of light shoots out, and from the cube emerges a mechanical arm. The arm speaks with great joy, saying that it has been saved, and it thanks Hikaru for rescuing it. Hikaru is terrified and tries to back away. The arm speaks again, trying to get to know Hikaru, but Hikaru is angry and tells it to stay away from him. However, the arm clings to his clothes. At that moment, a drone delivery aircraft arrives, announcing that it has located the target. The drone attempts to sever the arm, but Hikaru starts running away, with the arm following closely behind him, claiming that Hikaru is its friend and its savior. Hikaru gets even more frustrated and demands the arm leave him alone. The drone gets closer, but the arm sabotages it, causing the drone to crash to the ground. Surveillance drones capture pictures of them, and we hear someone saying, I want us to work together and get out of here. Scene then shifts to another location, where a girl is speaking. We've identified the location of the trigger arm. Seems to have fused with a human who has no connection to the incident. An elderly man responds in surprise. Is he someone from arms? The girl replies, we're still investigating, but he's most likely a civilian. She then asks her superior what they should do next. The superior responds, I'll leave the matter to you. The elderly man instructs the girl to seal off a two-kilometer perimeter around the area and prioritize recovering the trigger arm. He adds, I don't care what happens to the brat. After that, we see Hikaru and Alama hiding from the surveillance cameras. Alama comments, you have amazing running abilities. Hikaru replies, I'm the only one putting in the effort and asks Alama for his name. Alama responds, I want to answer that question, but I can't even remember my own name. However, there's one thing I do know your kind because you saved me. I can't move freely due to the lack of arbitrarium. Alama then asks Hikaru for his name, but Hikaru walks away telling him you can move now. Alama tries to stop him, saying we're still in danger. I'm really worried about you. Hikaru responds, the more I think about it, the more I realize that all of this is your fault. I'll be fine if I stay away from you. Alama is saddened and begs Hikaru not to leave him alone. Hikaru, feeling a little guilty, comes back and takes Alama with him. Alama thanks him, but suddenly the surveillance drones reappear. Alama tells Hikaru, leave it to me this time, and they quickly escape. Off. Then, a boy appears, preparing to fight Alama. We hear Murazame talking through a headset, saying that she is headed to the designated area. Someone replies, head south, you'll reach the other side of the building on your right. Sasin cuts back to Haikuru, still running away with Alama. Haikaru mutters, how long will they keep chasing us? Morasam then appears in front of them, addressing Alama, saying, I finally found you. I will kill you if you move. Sent speaks up, saying, you should first declare that you came to protect them. The boy who appeared earlier also steps in and says to Sense's arm, I have a score to settle with you for what happened yesterday. He intends to fight alongside Murasam. Ah, yeah. Haikaru and Alama make a run for it, but Murasam sees them and tries to follow. However, she is distracted by the boy, who attacks her. She says in frustration, none of you will stop getting in my way. Kikaru, feeling guilty, thinks to himself, I shouldn't have even considered this. Alama then urges Hikaru to leave him behind, saying, I'm their target. I don't want to involve you further. I can't stand seeing good people get hurt. Please, forget everything you saw here today. Murasam reappears and says, have you had enough of running from me? Don't cause me more trouble, Te Alama replies. I will obey your orders, so please leave him alone. Hikaru, however, retorts, don't make decisions on your own. So if I leave you here, my conscience will haunt me. Hikaru then charges at Murasame, and Alama delivers a powerful blow, knocking her to the ground. She is unable to continue fighting and collapses, but quickly stands again as they flee once more. During this escape, Hikaru and Alama finally start to get to know each other and become friends. The scene shifts to the boy, who is clearly exhausted, saying, who stole my mechanical arm? That arm belongs to me. Later, we see Murasam, who is approached by the boy. He says to her, you failed to capture him. Sense apologizes, saying, I didn't expect a civilian to be able to use Alama's power. Where? The boy he's bonded with, I'm certain the Kagami group will identify him soon. We need to act quickly. I'll let you handle it again. Thus, today's episode of the anime ends. Stay tuned for the next episodes, and don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you won't miss anything new. Our episodes begin today with Konai, the Demon King. As he wakes up and finds a co-welcoming him and preparing breakfast, he asks her, 
What are these scraps? She tells him that it was her sister, Luna, who did that. Then we see Luna, who is very upset because she tried to trim her hair but ruined it. At that moment, Kune enters the room and says to her, Be quiet, girl. Don't be so trivial. Luna gets angry and says, No, you be quiet, you arrogant old man with that ridiculous hair. Kunai gets furious, grabs her, and strikes her on her waist so hard that she starts crying from the pain. The scene then shifts to Kunai in the hot bath, drinking coffee. He now owns everything since he is the main programmer of that game, so he can use anything freely. He starts to think that if he could use magic, it would add a fantastic touch. He imagines the kingdom of holy light, resembling medieval Europe, warm but with scarce water. A day here consists of 24 hours, and a year has 365 days. For Konai, this world seems perfectly fitting. He then recalls the skeleton that called him in the Temple of Wishes. Rumors say that skeleton was once a boxer named Ofan. What a strange world, he thinks. Even their naming conventions are ridiculous. There's a girl named Queen, and that strange man with odd hair is named Fujo. How bizarre, he thought. Then there's that highwayman called Ongol. After that, we have Lady Epifri and her twin sister, Kavifri, who are both giants and love rice, stuffed vegetables, mulukia, and fried potatoes. Then there's that mustached man, the chief called Dona Dona, who is a rival to that lady. Kanai reflects again, thinking, this place has such a strange culture, but I shouldn't judge. I have to manage using the infinite features of the game. The items he creates using his skill points generate vast profits because of their demand. That useless music box has only one attack point, but it sells for 15 large gold coins. He also used the building feature to construct many facilities. The character change feature headed for fun turned out to be very useful. He even created a delinquent character from the 80s, named Zero Kairosam, who could be handy in certain situations. He called upon his assistants and left the tasks he didn't have time to handle to them. One of them is the exceptional doctor and scientist, Yu Kirino. She even restored Ako's leg to its original state, proving her remarkable abilities. The other assistant is Asemi Tahara, whom he made a genius. He's also skilled with firearms and has a strong affection for his younger sister. Story goes that Kanai saved them both, so Asemi never disobeys him. Konai then speaks, I don't know if I will ever be able to return to my world or if I'll remain here. Until then, I need to plan well to survive in this world. So the scene then shifts to the saint, Claire Queen. Her servant comes to inform her that Angel White has returned. Angel White enters, greets her, and, to Claire's shock, she sees the glowing halo above her head. Angel responded that it was an angelic halo, and someone had given it to her. She then remembered when Konai had gifted her the halo, as a way to protect her name from being sullied. Angel was overjoyed by the gift and thanked him. Konai asked her to dedicate herself to ensuring that the halo remained untainted and told her that he was never her enemy. Angel was deeply surprised how could the demon king possess such a halo. She snapped back to reality when her sister Claire commented, you smell like a man. Who is it? She suspected it must be someone who wields a holy sword or something of the sort which is why Angel might have admired him. Claire then asked if she had any issues with Zero, since she had often heard Angel speak about how amazing he was. Claire recalled the time when the city guards had tried to assault her, and Zero had stood up to protect her. Tso's men were extremely weak, as they threatened women and children. Zero, full of rage, appeared before them, furious that they dared to attack a woman. He believed they didn't even deserve to know who he was. The guards tried to kill him, but Zero was able to take them all down in less than a second. No one could escape the wrath of the dragon. When he finished with them, Zero told them they would need a thousand years to face a dragon again. Afterward, Zero spoke to Claire, asking if she was all right. She responded that she was fine, though flustered. He then asked why a woman like her was facing armed men. Claire, too embarrassed to reply, remained silent. Zero then told her to inform him if those scum ever appeared again and he would rush to her rescue. Claire was overjoyed and thanked Zero for what he had done for her. We return to reality as Claire expresses her desire to meet the man who gave her sister the halo. She jokes, saying that he'll have to pass a test, which involves surviving a brutal beating from her. Angel immediately asks her not to do that, saying she doesn't have that much pride. Meanwhile, we see the villagers happy and healthy, thanks to Dr. Yu Sensei, who treated them. The doctor is strikingly beautiful. The village chief approaches and asks you how things are going. She replies, the reputation of the hospital is spreading. People say we can cure all diseases. The chief responds, 
This village will thrive with you around, and you thanks him. She then adds, I'd like to ask for a reward. If you don't mind, I want us to have dinner together. Suddenly, some people rush in asking for Yu's help to save their friend, who had fallen at a construction site. She quickly instructs them to bring him into the treatment room. As Yu enters, she comments, the development of pharmaceuticals is amazing, and so is performing surgeries. I'm in a great mood today, so I'll explain the procedure wonderfully. She begins to treat the boy. The scene shifts to Luna in the field, working. A girl tells her, don't do that, you'll get dirty. Leave the field work to us. Luna responds, I can't help it. I don't need to bathe you or use the well water anymore. Thanks to the Demon King, there's unlimited hot spring water. I'm happy because I've become the holy virgin overseeing Rabi village. It used to be barren land with no crops, but look at it now. Her friend responds, all of this is thanks to the Demon King. Luna, irritated, replies, no, it was because of me. I took him under my wing and made him work hard. You're the only rabbits capable of growing carrots. The girl humbly responds, we should be grateful to you. So we humble half-human creatures who normally aren't allowed to lair in the kingdom. Long ago, an angel loved us deeply, which is why we've succeeded. You're the only one who treated us kindly without looking down on us. Luna explains, I was given this village of half-human creatures because of who I am. I had a human friend when I was little, which is why I was assigned here a sort of punishment. The scene transitions to Eagle and Luna. Luna urges Eagle run fast. If we don't get there quickly, we won't find any bread. We have to make the most of the copper coins the Holy Virgin gave us. I can't focus on my magic studies when I'm hungry. Magic is the only thing that makes you act responsibly. They stop in front of a store and Eagle says, this place is famous. The two girls finally arrive at the store, wishing they could one day eat here whenever they wanted. Just then, two men approach them. The fat one sneers, what are two filthy poor girls like you doing in a place like this? At least walk along the edge of the road, so we don't have to see you. The other man chimes in, the current holy virgin is annoying because she treats scum like you far too kindly. The fat man becomes angry, accusing the girls of staring at them too much. The other man mocks them, saying they smell like animals and have ruined his meal. Luna steps forward, furious, and says, I'll make you regret this. I'm going to join the holy church when I'm older and become a holy virgin. When that happens, I'll make you regret every word you said to us. The men become enraged, but suddenly, Luna releases a huge surge of magical power. Energy radiates around her, shocking the two men, who instantly flee in terror. After that, the two sisters Luna and Eagle sit down to eat. Eagle asks her sister if she really plans to join the holy church, and Luna confidently replies, I won't just join the church, I will become a holy virgin. And when that happens, I won't mind making you my dear sister, one of my servants. Watch me and wait for that day. Eagle is overjoyed because she trusts her sister. The scene then shifts to a man from the holy church welcoming Luna, informing her that she will undergo training to become a holy virgin and must prepare to leave. To leave, Luna tells him that she has a servant she wishes to bring along. The church official realizes she means Eagle and informs Luna that Eagle is no longer part of their world she had been executed because research revealed she was half human. Luna is shocked and her sister, Eagle, is devastated. The official explains that Eagle had snuck into the holy capital and was executed. Juna furious protests, saying, but she didn't commit any crime. The man coldly replies, being half human is a sin in itself. Hadi then adds, but don't you aspire to become a holy virgin? In that case, you must be mindful of whom you associate with. Luna is heartbroken by Eagle's death and cannot believe she is truly gone. The church official confirms that their kingdom will never allow half humans to live. The scene shifts back to Luna, who is now visibly happy, stating that she will ensure the prosperity of the village. To Demon King Konai, approaches her, praising her mentality and thanking her for her efforts. Luna is startled by his presence. Kanai tells her, I appreciate you taking on the responsibility of developing this village, and I expect great results from you. Luna, annoyed retorts, what are you saying? This is my land. You're the one who should be working hard. Konai responds that he is working hard, and the money is flowing into their coffers. Scene then transitions to a group of girls admiring the artistic works of Lady Butterfly. Lady Butterfly explains to them that this type of door is called Fusuma, but touching it when entering or exiting would ruin the artwork. The beauty of the piece develops over time. The door opens and two beautiful girls greet them at the Hot Springs Resort. We then shift to Lady Butterfly, 
who asks Konai if he's interested in splitting the profits with her 50-50. Konai agrees, saying that they need each other to make high profits, which will also reduce the chances of either of them betraying the other. Lady Butterfly remarks to herself that Konai is unlike any man she has ever met. The next scene shows Konai observing everyone's work, thinking to himself, I'll ensure this village prospers in the best way possible. He then tells the electronic screen to contact Tahara and instructs him to take the items that Lady Epiphray will showcase and in sell them at a discount to a merchant named Mandan in the city of Yahoo. This will make Mandan believe he's going to earn massive profits by maintaining a relationship with them. Konai A also plans to use that money to repair and expand Rabi Village. She tells Tahara not to hold back any funds when it comes to fulfilling the needs of the rabbits and paying their wages, as his goal is to turn the village into a wealthy place that rains gold. Tahara responds, calling Konai a very smart and terrifying leader. Konai ends the call with Tahara, but he feels like Tahara may have misunderstood a few things. We then return to Tahara who talks to himself, saying, you want to make the village rich and rain gold. This will make the neighboring villages envy us, and eventually they'll ask, what are our leaders doing? They impose taxes on us, and we get nothing in return. As Tahara finishes assembling his gun, he comments on how fearsome their leader is. Then the scene shifts to Konai, who is lying beside the girls and thinking to himself. He reflects on how he plans to develop the village, but admits that his biggest fear is his inability to defend against magic. Magic didn't exist in the infinite game, so he feels the need to acquire items that can block or deflect magic as a precaution. In the morning, we see Konai as he prepares to leave the kingdom to conduct some research. He entrusts the hospital to you and gives Tahara the responsibility of overseeing the village. He sternly tells Tahara, if anyone approaches with the intent to harm the village, kill them. Don't leave them alive. Konai then boards his carriage and departs. And that's how today's episode of the anime concludes. To stay updated with new episodes, please subscribe to the channel and activate the notification bell to receive all the latest content.